Hello and welcome to Harriet's Fussy Eaters. My name is Harriet Bartlett and I'm not a farmer, I'm not a nutritionist and I'm definitely not a campaigner. I'm a scientist and a researcher and I'm focused on figuring out the best ways to farm for people, the environment and the animals that we farm. I'm half a vet, sort of. I'm an Essex girl and I'm a proud fussy eater. It can be really tricky trying to figure out what's best to eat. We're bombarded by contradictory information, full of jargon and from people with hidden agendas. But don't worry, I'm here to help. I'm here to give you the information that you need to make informed choices about what you eat and to choose foods that align with your values and make you happy. I'm very privileged that I have access to the most up-to-date and the best science and I want to share this with you. But I'm going to warn you now, we don't yet know everything. But I'm going to share what we do know and when we discover and learn more, I'm going to make some more videos and share those with you. I'm fussy about my food's impact on the environment, on animal welfare, on antibiotic use and resistance, on pandemic risk, and I think you should be too. Let's start by being fussy about the impacts of farming on biodiversity. Are some ways of farming better than others? Are some foods better than others? And before we get into it, we need to remember that food and farming is really important. We've got to eat, and so it needs to be a major part of the solution. Let's start by talking about the words intensive and factory farm. What do you think of when I say those words? Because for a lot of people, they carry a lot of negative baggage, and you might have seen headlines like these. But the words intensive farming, factory farming are actually pet peeves of mine and that's because they're really poorly defined. Almost everyone you ask will give you a different definition. So I'd like to invite you to join me and other scientists and talk about yields instead. So the yield is the amount of product you produce per unit area. And so for example, if you have two pieces of land and one's producing twice as much product from the same area, this would be relatively high yield compared to low yield. And so now that we've covered yields, let's move on to biodiversity. Biodiversity is the diversity of living things on Earth. And why is it important? Well, there's two main arguments. The first is that biodiversity has value regardless of how helpful it is to people. And when we talk about this, we use the jargon intrinsic value. The second argument is, again jargon, anthropocentric or human-centred value. And the argument goes that biodiversity provides ecosystem services, things like pollination, climate regulation, flood protection, suppression of disease emergence, and that's why it should be valued. And I think we can all agree that these are pretty important things, and they've actually been valued at equivalent to several trillion US dollars per year, equivalent to over double China's GDP. But there's a problem, we're losing it really fast. So fast that we're technically in a human-driven mass extinction. Yes, comparable to the wipeout of the dinosaurs and unfortunately due to the actions of people. And so what's causing this biodiversity loss? Well, there's lots of drivers, but the key one that we're gonna talk about is habitat destruction, because this is the one that agriculture has a key role in. Currently, about half of all habitable land on Earth is used for food production, and we need to increase food production considerably in the near future. So we need to think really carefully about how we're going to do this, because we can't just do more of what we're already doing. We need to strategize and plan a path with the least negative impact. And so now that we've spoken about biodiversity loss and yields, we're ready to now talk about the best ways to farm for biodiversity. When you think about biodiversity or nature-friendly farming, you might think of something like this, a piece of farmed land with measures or practices in place that are good for biodiversity in and amongst the food production. When you think of a farm that's bad for biodiversity, you might think of something like this, an intensive high yield farm. But actually, it's not that simple and the opposite might be true. There's growing evidence that high yield farming is better for biodiversity. And I know it sounds crazy, but this is when we have to go back to yields. The biodiversity friendly farm is low yield. 
These biodiversity friendly measures on farm mean you need a larger area to produce a set amount of food. This is compared with a high yield system where you need a much smaller area to produce that set amount of food. And this is where it's really important to not just think about the farmed area, you need to think about the consequences for other land. And because high yield farming uses a much smaller area, we could use the other land just for nature where it doesn't have to share with farming. This brings us to two ends of a spectrum. We have land sharing, where we use land for food and biodiversity on the same piece of land. The other end, we've got land sparing, where you're using high yield farming combined with sparing intact habitat for biodiversity. And so what we have to do next is do some science. We need to go and measure the populations of wild species in land sparing and land sharing situations. And there's growing evidence that land sparing Increasing yields on existing farmland and sparing intact habitat for biodiversity is the best option for most species. But again, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So there are four key considerations. First, in land sparing, we need to make sure that that spared land actually goes to nature. Really important. Second, it can be context dependent. So most of the data that supports this simple land sparing best conclusion is from tropical countries. So it's thought that in places like Europe, particularly the UK, they might have slightly different results. And in some situations, it's been found that the best option for biodiversity is a three compartment sparing model. And this means that we have some high yield farming, some intact habitat for biodiversity, and some land that's also farmed at very low yield but this last compartment doesn't produce that much food. So the vast majority of food comes from the high yield compartment. So this is what most people would have to eat in this situation. Third, high yield farming doesn't have to be completely devoid of life. There are some people working on high yield biodiversity friendly farming. Imagine the best of both worlds. But the key question is, if you're going to put a biodiversity friendly practice on farm, does it reduce the yield? And if it does, it needs to be carefully compared with instead sparing a little bit of land. And last, we can't promote unsustainable high yield systems, systems with really damaging practices that degrade the land, for example. And not only because they'd lead to reduced yields and be completely counterproductive anyway. There needs to be a balance, a sustainable high yield. So that's the best ways of farming. And now let's move on to how you can be fussy about the impacts of your foods on biodiversity and the choices that you can make. First, you could reduce your food waste. It's estimated that over a quarter of global agricultural land is used to produce food that's eventually wasted. There's of course issues along the supply chain, but you can do your bit as a consumer and only buy what you need and not waste. Second, you can avoid products that are associated with direct habitat loss. You've probably heard stories about beef and soy in the Amazon and deforestation. And it's important to remember that most soy goes to animal feed, about 90% in the UK goes to animal feed and only 10% is consumed directly by people. And there's other products associated with deforestation, things like palm oil, chocolate, coffee. Um, and what I recommend you do is Go onto the websites and have a look into those products that you buy. See if they have a deforestation pledge, for example. And if they don't, you could email them. And while you're at it, you could ask them about their yields. Third, there's a movement towards less and better of these high land use or low yield products. And foods vary a lot in terms of their yields. So here are some global averages. You can see that beef, lamb, cheese, dark chocolate are all up there. And so if you could substitute these for a lower land use product, that could help. But you don't need to cut it out completely if you can't. We know that reducing can go a really long way. For example, if the two billion highest consumers of meat and dairy reduced their meat and dairy consumption by 40%, we could save an area of land twice the size of India. Fourth, if you're not keen on switching up the types of products you eat, you could try to substitute a low yield version of one product to a high yield version of the same product. 
it's known that the yields of farms producing the same products vary a lot. For example, the highest impact 25% of beef producers in the world represent over 60% of land use of beef. And this could be significantly reduced if, for example, like in the UK, a large portion of beef comes from the dairy industry, which has higher yields because the system produces both milk and beef. Again, ask your retailer, ask your butcher, um, ask your employer about their suppliers and use your newfound fussy voice. And last, but by no means least, you could work with us. We really need all hands on deck, working towards solutions and action plans on how we're gonna solve these big problems. So why don't you consider a career in agriculture? Reducing your intake of high impact products is the easiest switch that you can make today, as it's quite straightforward switching from those high impact to low impact products. What's much more difficult is picking better versions of the same product. And I'd love to see that information on a supermarket shelf. Imagine a label with a farm specific yield and information on any biodiversity friendly measures on that farm. It'd be great, that would help us to make informed decisions and be fussy about the products we were choosing. So now you know why I'm fussy about farming and biodiversity, but it's not the only thing I'm fussy about when it comes to food. And you can learn much more by subscribing to my channel and following me on social media. Thank you for listening and don't forget to be a fussy eater.